going on everybody welcome into the Chandler Lyle show I am so excited to have you in today and you know what guys this show exists for small business owners I was reading on the SBA's website the other day you know we've got so much craziness going on in the world right now uh, and I went on the SBA's website and I came across a, a stunning statistic 50% of small businesses fail within five years of opening just let that sink in for a second 50% of small businesses fail within five years of opening that's it's sad and it's staggering. So this show exists to help other small business owners. We're trying our whole mission here is to lower that number down. And today I am super excited to have a longtime friend of mine on the show, a barbecue brethren, Mikey K from Man Meat Barbecue Podcast, the Man Meat Barbecue Instagram channel, and Fire and Smoke. Uh, catering company in the Chicago land area. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Mikey K. Mikey, how are you doing today? What's up, Chandler? How are you, buddy? I'm really excited to be on here and uh, getting to chat with you. Yeah, it's usually the other way around, isn't it? Like I, you, you've it got is. your podcast, and I've been on a couple times, and so I'm glad I finally get a chance to return the favor. Yeah, it's it's a little terrifying being on the side of the uh, on this side of the microphone. <laughs> How many how many episodes are you guys up to now with the Man Meat Barbecue podcast? Um, I think this week we're releasing two seventy two or two seventy three. Man, um, so we go one episode a week every single Thursday. It comes out. Um, it gets kind of you know filtered through all the all the uh, different channels that you can go through. Uh, we're on Google Play, uh, Spotify iTunes, obviously, uh, Stitcher, Stitcher throws it into a ton of all the like little, um, the little podcasting apps that some people like to use. A lot of Android people like to use that one. So, um, that's kind of where yeah, you guys gets. have been doing it for a long time and now you're over bit, like, yeah. way past a hundred thousand subscribers on Instagram now. And, yeah. uh, I'm just so excited cause I, I knew, I like to say I knew you way back when, and now you're, it's you're, true, you know, yeah. now you're, you're owning your own business and, and getting after I I'm so excited. So I know everything about you, but I'm excited to bring your story to everybody else out there. So do me a favor. Like, why did you start the Instagram channel? Cause I know that came first and then the podcast, like tell us the story of that. And then we'll, we'll get into the, the catering company later. So I started the Instagram or I started the Instagram because I wanted to start the podcast. And I was like, Instagram would be a great, you know, way to promote the podcast a great way for me to find people to actually want to sit down and chat with me. So I was like trying to do all this stuff, trying to do like trying to put it all together and try to make it the perfect package, you know, like we all do. We're like, no, it's not ready to be released. It's not ready to be released. I, I want it to be the perfect package. And my neighbor actually, my he's my old neighbor because I don't I don't live in that um, apartment complex anymore. My old neighbor used to teach broadcasting and podcasting at Columbia College in Chicago, Illinois. So I asked him, I'm like, his name was Matt. I'm like, Matt, can you give me some tips on what, what should I do? How do I make this the perfect package? Like, what does the intro need to be like? What does this need to be like? And all this stuff. And he's like, it doesn't. And I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't? Like, it, it no, I need it. Like, it's not perfect yet. It's not. He's like, stop. He's like, no one's going to listen to the first five podcasts you ever do. And I'm like, that's kind of sucks, doesn't it? I'm like, he's like, no, he's like, it's great. No, he's like, it's fantastic. He's like, cause you can fall on your face in those first five or 10 or whatever podcasts that nobody's listening to. And then you'll start to get into your flow and you'll start to get into your groove. He's like, and you'll find your voice. And I'm like, okay, okay. So I'll do that. So I, um, I just started, just started recording. And I used to sit at my kitchen table uh, and just and just record. And um, I finally got, you know, I, I would message people and be like, hey, will you come on my barbecue podcast? And people were like, yeah, how many listeners do you have? And I'm like, none. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you come on, maybe we'll have like four. <laughs> so we, we let it just slowly started building. And then I remember it like. Because podcasts are pretty difficult to see the the actual numbers of, um, because they get distributed so much, 
and into so many different um, places that it's very difficult to get a, a, a full number. Well, we use Square to host our podcast, uh, Squarespace, and um, they kind of give you a, 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 a guesstimate, realistic example of what they think is getting di uh, digested, right? Because iTunes will never really give you their real numbers. It's just, it's an Apple thing. Love it or hate it. You know, it's just, it's what they do. But I remember the first time I saw those numbers hit 500. And I was like, oh my God, dude, there's 500 people listening to this. And like the Instagram started like kind of gaining traction. I was like, maybe at like 3,000 followers on Instagram, which I was like, dude, I have like 3,000 followers on Instagram. This is awesome. And it was slowly gaining traction. Things were starting to move a little bit. Things were starting to move. And then um, then it started going like really rapid. I mean, at one point, I think I was gaining 700, like probably 500 to 700 followers a day at one point. Like it, like my phone would not stop going off. It was just like, like almost, almost too annoying. Like I would post something and my phone would just blow up. Because Instagram used to be different where they used to be um, – they actually used to put things into people's feeds. They don't anymore. Um, they, they've definitely pulled a lot of that stuff out in that social media realm of that, that, which is why so many people are kind of fleeing and trying to go other places where they can get – you know, where real estate is cheap right now. Like TikTok right now, real estate is super cheap in TikTok. Um, and when I say real estate is cheap, um, people sometimes are like, what do you mean? You're not buying anything in TikTok. No, I mean like followers are cheap. It's easy. To, the the inquiry, inquiring a follower doesn't cost as much as it costs on Facebook or Instagram because it's just different. Yeah, TikTok is uh, it's organic reach is what you're talking about. So exactly, the organic yeah. reach is is the discoverability on TikTok right now is just it's out of this through world. the roof. Honestly, I've never seen another social network. You know me, like marketing's been my thing for a long time. Like I've never seen a algorithm that find you what you want to watch as the user more effectively than TikTok has. It truly blows me away. Take all the little kids on there dancing out of it. Like if that thing ages up, it's going to, it's going to be real problems for Instagram and Facebook and things like that. And honestly, Instagram and Facebook right now, if you're going to be on a marketing, you know, we'll get a little more in depth into details and stuff here in a little bit after we get your story, but like you've got to pay to play on those channels now. And if you don't have a massive Absolutely. budget, there's no room for you just to be organic anymore. You just have to do some like, really crazy stuff to break through the organic traffic filters in the, in that Facebook and Instagram algorithm. So, um, so, so you got, you got the show going, you got it rolling and then you did, how long did you do that before you started trying to sell some barbecue on the side? Cause you had a full-time so, job. Another thing is this was your side hustle. You had a full-time job while you were doing all this. Correct. Yeah. I had a full-time job. Uh, I worked for, I, I did sales for a company out of, uh, California and um, I, I, I traveled for them quite, quite extensively. Um, and I, I, you know, had a full time job. Um, I started doing the, the podcast started getting bigger and started hitting, hitting more people. We started getting more opportunities to start doing more events with people. Um, what I actually started doing is I started teaching classes. I started teaching barbecue classes. Um, I, I taught a couple of big green egg classes. I enjoyed it. People were really starting to enjoy the food. Um, most people enjoyed the food that I was cooking in general. Um, and then it was always, well, why don't you, why don't you cook? And cooking's always been a, been a really, really big thing in my life. And I, I've always said it was, if I wasn't doing this, I probably should have been a chef. If I wasn't doing this, I probably should have been a chef. And I kept saying that. And then one day you know, one of, one of my friends was like, why aren't you one? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, I didn't know the answer to that. Right. And so then I started like really looking back at it. I'm like, man, I really kind of want to just cook barbecue for a living. Like, this is what I want to do for a living. And how do I make that possible? How do I make cooking barbecue for a living possible? And with the platform that I had, I was talking to restaurant owners like yourself. I was talking to pit masters. I was talking to guys that owned rub lines, guys that owned sauce lines, all this stuff. 
And I just started picking all their brains. It was, well, how did you get into it? How did, how did you do this? And then I started going, well, I can do that. Well, I can do that. Okay, I can do that, right? And what we ended up doing is we, we ended up selling some, some barbecue to friends and uh, a couple other friends bought some more stuff than some other people asked to buy some stuff. Um, and it slowly started, you know, kind of gather getting that little snowball effect. And then I started looking at how do, how do I do this fully legally? Right. Uh, we got the yeah, commissary. All food, all food purveyors, man. We all start out a little shady. It's kind of like uh, we're, we're a little too close to drug dealers, if you ask me. <laughs> Yeah, which, which is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Um, so that's how I started, man. I, I went around my office and I was literally selling ribs to my coworkers, like under the table, straight cash, you know, yeah. d- during break times. Hey, you want to get the rack? You know, let's do a deal. Which is, I mean, that that's also how Trudy's Underground started, which is okay. all uh, out in uh, LA. He did a huge thing. He was, he was called Trudy's Underground. You should look, look them up. But, yeah. uh, you know, started doing that. And I looked, looked at how to do this legally. Um, I, I realized that I didn't have quite the amount of money that I wanted to, um, for all of you restaurant people and restaurant entrepreneurs that want to start a restaurant, they cost a lot of money, like a lot, uh, <laughs> um, a lot of money. So I was like, how do I do this? And, actually be able to create income and, and, and have money to keep going. Right. So I, you know, I, I looked at, I talked to a couple of friends and I was like, you know, looked at, I was like, maybe I should get some business partners. Hmm. You know, maybe that's a good idea. Started looking at business partners, talked to a couple of friends, had a friend that was, you know, a friend forever decided that, you know, he was going to be part of it and all that stuff. And then um, we kind of created the LLC. Didn't really know what we were doing completely. Um, I had done sole proprietorships ever, you know, for forever um, in my, in my past, past lives of business and uh, doing an LLC is a whole different game, right? It's a whole different setup. Um, So we did that totally botched it up, had lawyers fix it. Don't worry about it. They're good. Uh, (laughs) But you know, cost some money. And we, we, um, we started going, let, let's go to breweries and let's do pop-ups, right? There's a lot of breweries in the Chicago land area. There's not many with food, uh, because kitchens cost a lot of money and they just don't want to do it. And honestly, another little thing here that we realized, cause we, we started in a very similar way. We were doing our, our, we had a, we were doing the food truck circuit, but we just had a tent. So it was basically a pop-up every time we did it. Uh, yeah. and we figured out quickly that, breweries in a lot of towns are in industrial districts because it's cheaper slash they have more space, but their tap rooms, they're not allowed to have restaurants because if they did that, it would change the zoning for their area, which would cause a a whole bunch of other legal problems. So if you are starting a food thing, do what I did, do what Mikey did, like get a tent, go, go start your side hustle at the breweries. Yeah. So we started doing that and we started getting more and more jobs uh, you know, we, we popped up at one brewery, popped up at another brewery. Um, they told that, you know, they told their friends about, about us, about how the food's fantastic, how we're great. So, so, you know, naturally it started to spiral a little bit and I have, a, a, you know, I have a background in sales. I'm, I'm decent at it. And, uh, I was like, well, what if I kind of cold call a couple of these breweries and see if we can't come in. Right. Um, and then that kind of just spiraled it out where it was like, we're getting, you know, booked every you know we're booking thursday night friday saturday and i started i'm I'm still working a full-time job at this point um and i'm traveling i'm you know i got a kid uh (laughs) everything that you could possibly not have time for i'm doing (laughs) so i'm looking at it and i i'm looking at saying well i want fire and smoke barbecue company to be my full-time job i want it to be my full-time job and I looked at it and I said, if I don't leave my full-time job, fire and smoke barbecue company will never grow. I'm doing as, and I understand the whole, everyone's like, well, no, you do the side hustle until you replace it. On some things, yes, I agree with you on that. But 
when you're doing barbecue, I can't not I can't work on Friday till five o'clock and then show up at a pop-up at six when I'm the one that has to cook the food. Right? Yeah, and you're to to clarify really quickly, you do old school barbecue, you know, Absolutely. hardwood and no gas, no anything, no electric, no, gas. no pellets, none of that stuff. We're not nope. even going to get into the, we'll leave the nerdy barbecue talk like for when I come yeah. back on your show. Uh, but I mean, you are doing it the real old school way, which is, yeah. it is, it is love and care, but it is a labor of love for Absolutely. sure. And it, it tests, it tests your care uh, a lot because you have to be so dedicated to that because you're literally standing over a fire 12, 15 hours. And you're in Chicago. The weather there is terrible 10 months Fantastic. of the year. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. No, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like you don't like cooking in snow? No, you would send me some photos sometimes in your t-shirt and shorts out there on your your grills and stuff in your back patio area. And I was just like, there's not a chance in hell. I'm ever getting out and doing it in that weather. And like, I remember you used to complain in Lexington when it would get down to like 40 and we'd be outside smoking. And I'd just be like, I, I don't want to do this. I can't, I can't, I'm from South Georgia originally, man. I don't, I don't do cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wuss, man. You guys are way tougher than me. You get me in a hundred degree heat though. Like you're not going to touch me. All right, we're, we're fine. Yes. Yeah. See, I, like hundred degree heat is where I'm like, dude, I'm fat. I can't do this. Okay. Like <laughs> I'm sweating, but man. yeah. You know, we, I started looking at it and, uh, um, I talked to the wife and I was like, listen, if I don't leave my, if I don't leave my job, um, there's going to be some problems. And this is, this is coming. This is, uh, just so you, just so people that know what was going on. I was, I was making a six figure salary, not salary, but, uh, uh, you know, I was making six figures and I left that to go be a pit master for a barbecue company. <laughs> like. <laughs> because I wanted to do my own thing. I, I, I wanted to be my own boss. And um, it's a scary move. It's terrifying when you're like, okay, cool. Well, where's my paycheck coming from? And it's like, you got to go make it. Like, go go make your paycheck. Mm -hmm. Very terrifying. Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting. You you hit on it a little bit earlier where you said most people would say, try to get your side hustle making a little bit of income so you're not just jumping uh, with no uh, backup plan. You know what I mean? Like it, it yeah. is interesting to me that you made that jump. Do you feel like, because where you're at now, like you're still early on in the process, you know, you're still Absolutely. like kind of transitioning, you know, you're, you guys are in the process of getting a trailer made and then, you know, yeah. quarantine hit and that kind of slowed yeah. everything down. Do you think looking back now, you'd rather have, have waited or do you still feel like it was the right move? Um, it was 110% the right move. To be honest, um, if, if looking back on it right now, I would have doubled down even harder. And I would have put, I would have forced the trailer faster mm -hmm. than, than we actually did. Um, because my 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 ex business partner actually slowed that down, and it it was starting to snowball so quickly, right? What snowball? We were, as as in like, dude, we were starting to get booked so much. We were in. I mean, I would be. We would be in between Thursday, or almost almost between yeah, thir most weeks almost Thursday till till Sunday. We were any in between in, in anywhere from five to six breweries. So we had two teams going out to two different breweries to do, do, wow. do barbecue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there were places that we were selling out. Um, we would sell out and you know, we started at five and I'd get a text at six thirty, hey, we're packing up. Which was the which was a fantastic text. Cause it's like, you guys are out of food. Cause I know how much food I cooked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I know. It's a great problem to have. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay, cool. Fantastic, dude. I guess we'll cook a little bit more food next time we go there. But we were in so many breweries and then festivals started. Um, food truck festivals 
started like reaching out to us. They were like, dude, we want you guys. We want you guys. The only thing is you guys don't have a food truck. And we we're like, yeah, but we can do it in a tent. Like, is that a problem? And they're like, yeah, you have to have a food truck. Because mm. like up here, they're just like crazy about it being a food truck festival. Mm -hmm. And they want everyone to be in a food truck. Yeah, that's that's location dependent because down when we were in Absolutely. Washington doing yeah. it, we we got away with being in a tent the entire time, and then we just we skipped the food truck altogether. We we did a busted Kickstarter campaign, and then we just like whatever, we'll find a refurbished restaurant and move in, and it was a gas station in the middle of nowhere. So we we went the brick and mortar route. I was tired of sitting out in the weather and having things canceled and all the other nonsense that comes along with it. I like the idea of being in the food truck business in a bigger city like Chicago more than a small no, medium sized town. Oh, yeah. really? Why is that? The restrictions that they put on food trucks in the actual city um, are are insane. I mean, there are food trucks that are showing up at 3, 4 in the morning just to get their spots. Wow. Because they, they, limit, they, they limit down so hard on where you can actually have your food truck, especially in city limits. Um, you have to be so far away from an an actual restaurant or anywhere that serves food. Hmm. So like a Starbucks counts as a restaurant. What? Yeah. Uh. So they, they, they limit you down so hard and a lot of city, like a lot of like the, the more bougie towns around here won't let you park on any public, um, any public street. You can't park on any public street and you can't park in any, park on any public uh, parking lots. It has to be private. That's obnoxious. So, it, you know, Ugh. it's a little bit, it can be difficult, which is why a lot of food trucks go to breweries because they have, they have, um, they have parking lots of their own and you can go in the parking lot and, and just set up. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, anybody out there that's looking to get into the food game, you, you just need to do way more research than you think you do. And the best way before you start and the best way to get that research is just go and talk to other food truckers in the city. For the most part, like you'll run into one or two jerks that won't give you the time of day. But I find that the food truck culture, because we're all kind of in it together, uh, that yeah. most people I've talked to in the food truck business are willing to help and get you on schedules and give you some tips and all those things. I, it's actually a really cool tight knit community. So if you want to start a food truck business, like, Go make friends with three or four food truckers and literally just start the conversation with how do you do it? And for the most part, in my experience, at least they'll give you their entire business plan. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll tell you way too much. Uh, <laughs> just don't don't come up to us when we're um, in the middle of a rush. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, I love when people <laughs> come up to me and I'm like, I'm in the weeds and tickets. And they're like, hey, bro, I really want to know how to do this. And I was like, uh, like in an hour, mm -hmm. we can sit down and chat. But right yeah, yeah. now, I'm a little busy. And they're like, like no, I'm literally cool. going to be sold. I'm literally going to be sold out of food in one hour. Just just wait. <laughs> yeah, but they're always like, no, you can keep working. Don't worry. I don't mind. And I'm like, yeah, get yeah, away from me. It's it's not it's not easy either because in our in the restaurant business like you're a you're a customer you're such a customer service driven business like oh, every single person now especially with having Yelp reviews and Google Map reviews or whatever they're calling it, Facebook reviews uh, what what do you think about those sort of online review sites and so like, you mean your I think favorite Yelp stories slash horror stories yeah Yelp, Yelp is garbage Yelp mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I refuse to even uh, acknowledge it. Uh, especially with what they've been doing to restaurants lately um, with the coronavirus going around. Um, they're, they're changing restaurants' phone numbers on the Yelp pages to like Grubhub and all that kind of stuff so that Grubhub mm. can make more money mm. uh, and they're getting kickbacks from them. So I'm not a fan of that. But uh, I think Yelp owns Grubhub. I'm not 100% certain on that, but I'm so pretty sure Yelp why. owns Grubhub. Yeah. That could be exactly why. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we've gotten some funny reviews. I love those. Like, um, your pork belly was fatty. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Wait, wait. I want to sit Thank here you. for a second because I need to get on my soapbox. Like I kept my mouth shut for six years owning this barbecue restaurant. I, my least favorite person on the planet was the one that came in and said, your barbecue is too fatty. And I'm like, 
man, Thank look, you. like it's barbecue. <laughs> like you're going to get fat in your barbecue. Like this is not lean meat. Like don't yeah. order the chicken. I don't, what do you want me to do for you? Like you got brisket, you got, and the worst thing was you got the fatty end of the brisket and then you have the audacity to tell me there's too much fat in it. Yeah. And I'm like, you just you got the best part of the brisket. And you're complaining about yeah. it. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's not even close. It's the better part of the brisket, but some people's kids, man, I don't know. Uh, do you remember your first bad online review? Um, yeah, it was actually about our brisket being too fatty and overpriced. Um, oh, the overpriced one makes me so mad. Oh, they they told us that our our brisket was fatty and overpriced. Um, and so we sent them we sent them a private message saying, you know, we're really really sorry that you felt that way. We feel that the portions are proper for the for the price point that we're that we're doing. Um, we are serve you know we are serving prime briskets. Um, so those do cost us a little bit more and, uh, we'd like to, you know, offer you two free, you know, meals on us next time we're in, we're in your area. And they told us, they, they replied saying, well, we won't be coming back cause you're too expensive. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pay for it. Like, <laughs> honestly, I'm shocked. They responded at all. You would be. I think most people out there would be really surprised to find that restaurants try to go out of their way to do the right thing, even when they don't want to. And they'll message these negative reviews and they'll say, Hey, you know, we're so sorry you felt this way. Uh, here's kind of why we do it. We'd love to have you come back in again and try to make this right. And I did that so many times. And I got, I got, I maybe had one or two people over six years actually respond to me. Yeah. It's very few. And come far back between. in. Which is interesting to me. Like, if you're not willing to come back and give a restaurant a second chance, don't leave a bad review because you got, if you're going to be brave enough to talk smack about another person's business on the internet and not to their face, like, you've got to be brave enough to come back in and, and, and change your review if it's a better experience. I don't know. Again, like, I don't want to get too much on the soapbox issues here. Yeah. But. No. <laughs> I, uh, we also, we also had one that was, um, we had a guy tell us that our, our pork belly was too expensive. Um, that if you weighed it out completely, that it was more expensive for our pork belly than it is for a Ruth Chris uh, steak. And I'm like, not really, because you're getting eight ounces of pork belly for $11, and a Ruth Chris steak is six ounces, and it costs $60. So, I mean, I'm not, not a mathematician, but... Well, you know, so pork belly is just bacon, and and most of bacon yeah. is just like this solid strip of fat that sort of renders down either in a hot skillet or in a slow smoker. Yep. And what he's probably doing is just trimming the fat off of it to where there's that little piece of actual sure. meat there. And he's like, "You weigh that out." Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's like you're you need to eat all of it because it's it's meant mm -hmm. to be delicious and 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 eaten completely. But mm -hmm. um, he posted that online on um on on one of the local like facebook pages it wasn't even to us it was just on one of the local facebook pages and we had at that you know we were still really really new and i was like oh my god like this is going to destroy us and all of people that were at that pop-up apparently started seeing it and started like messaging like photographs of their food and like the portion sizes that they had and like the whole thread started getting crazy where the guy just took it down and they, they were like, you are ridiculous. You're completely wrong. And I'm like, we didn't even do anything. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you're like, That's Oh, awesome. okay. So they, they took care of it for us, which was, which is fantastic, I guess. Yeah. It's, I used to, I used to say this all the time, you know, the internet giveth and the internet taketh away, you know, the internet gave you yep. your Instagram and podcast, which is ultimately what launched your dream business now. And, uh, yeah. It also takes the way because when you get a bad review, it can have a tendency to like upset you for the rest of the day. You know, that's just, oh yeah. I don't care how tough you get and how thick skinned you get, like no restaurant owner on the planet. Like if they're being honest on the inside, they're very upset. It's not even, it's like it's not watching even somebody kick your dog. Yeah. That it's is really a great is. analogy. Yep. Yep. It's exactly right. Uh, so I, I want to circle back for a quick second. You, you, you're very passionate, right? You left a very, a very solid job to go pursue your dream. So, and how long ago was that again? Um, I left at the beginning of April 
in 2019. 19. Okay. Yep. And I've been, uh, been full time for a full year. Man, that's awesome. Congrats on one year in business, man. That's Thank there's you, dude. a good chunk of business is closed in a year. So, yeah. you know, that's no small thing. What in the last 12 months, what's been the best thing about owning your own business? Uh, best thing, honestly, the hustle. <laughs> oh, the game. The game, dude, it's, the it's, game. it's, it, it's so there, there's nothing better than going somewhere and pitching yourself and them going, yep, we want you. And there's nothing like that's an amazing part. And then the most amazing, amazing part is when you get the email and going, Hey, we had your food at X, Y, and Z. Now we want to book you for this. And we want to book you for that. And we want to bring you to our brewery or we want to bring you to our kid's birthday party. We want to bring you to our kid's graduation party. Like that's just the, like, you know, that's the best part because it's like, for me, food brings people together. So if you're bringing my food to bring your family together, I just think that's the, I mean, that's the number one goal, right? Mm -hmm. um, for restaurant people and even for chefs is we, we want to, we want to make food to, to make memories around and if you're using my food to make me your family memories around, I mean, that's fantastic to me. Yeah, I used to have a love-hate relationship with weddings. Um, I oh, hated God. the fact that they were so high pressure because it's such a big deal for that other family that I wanted everything to be perfect. Yep. But once we executed on everything and everything went smoothly, it was the best thing in the world to play a small role in somebody's big day. It's also uh, a really nice paycheck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wedding caterings are are way better. Uh, anybody out there having a catering business or getting ready to start one, uh, just hammer the wedding market. Like you need that revenue for sure. Uh, so on the other side of that coin, you know, we we all go into business, and you're, I know you're an entrepreneurial guy, but like, what's been the thing that sort of shocked you the most, or surprised you, or you didn't see coming in the last year? Like the biggest lessons learned over the last twelve months. Don't mess up your QuickBooks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't don't do that. Um, also, uh, a big lesson learned is um, it doesn't matter how good of friends you are with anybody. Uh, put contracts down. Mm -hmm. Figure the breakup out out before mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. the arranged marriage. <laughs> yep. It's it's really like I'm I'm not necessarily anti partnership. Um, I don't love them. Uh, I, I was in a partnership with my family for six years and, and it worked out great for us, but there was definitely moments where it was stressful. And, and for us in a family business, it was only, I loved my family at one a, and I loved my business at one B. And that little bit of differentiation was just enough to make sure our restaurant didn't blow up under that uh, relationship engagement thing. But had it been the other way around, had we all loved the restaurant more than we loved each other, like it would have blown oh, yeah. up so many times. And, yeah. and so you want to get very clear on, you know, if you die, if your partner dies, what happens to the business? If you get divorced, what happens to the business? If we want to separate, how do we buy each other out? Like you got to have those really awkward conversations on the front end. Because, yeah. And here, here's what honestly happens when you go, it's, it's kind of like pre-marriage counseling, honestly, like just treat it like you're getting married. Cause it's basically, you're getting married. No, you, I, you are getting married. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so I would literally almost bring in like a business coach or something like that to walk you guys through like questionnaires and, and really get deep with each other, like deeper than you think you're going to need to get. Uh, because at the end of the day, I'd rather have that awkward conversation on the front end than have to have it after we break up a million dollar business. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, and luckily, I didn't break up a million dollar business. We were we weren't doing that much money yet. Uh, it'd be fantastic if we were. Uh, but um, more zero, same problems. I promise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it didn't. It doesn't matter where the where the level really is, right? Uh -uh, but. Nope. Um, it definitely put a lot of stress and tension on the business at the end. Um, and it, it, it didn't need it. You know what I mean? It didn't, it didn't need it. Yeah. So moving on, what, what has been your favorite customer experience? That was one of the things I enjoyed the most about owning a business was the one-on-one -on -one interaction with like the real great customers, the regulars, like 
give us a good story around, you know, somebody had your product and what happened. Um, so, I mean, some of the, the great, you know, results of, you know, people coming up and being like, dude, this is amazing. Um, being from, I'm, I'm from born and raised in the Chicagoland area. Um, barbecue is not big here. We're, we're not known for our barbecue, right? So I have a lady come up to me and she's like, where are you from? And I'm like, we're, you know, we're based out of Elgin. Like I'm, I start telling her like where the business is from mm -hmm. because I, you know, that's what you think like, Hey, like, where are you from? Okay. Well, let me tell you where the business is, blah, 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 blah. Like, let me give you the, the whole spiel. And she's like, no, no, no. Let me stop you. Where were you born? And I'm like, why, why does that information need to come out right now? You know what I mean? Like, it's a little weird. And I'm like, I was born and raised in the Chicago land area in the suburbs. Why? And she's like, there's no way. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I was raised in Kansas. And I go, okay, fantastic. You know, barbecue central. Um, she goes, and my husband's from Texas. She goes, you have some of the best barbecue we've ever had. There's no way that you were born in Illinois. She's like, especially up north. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you, honey. And she goes, well, did you go to Texas to train? No. Did you go to Kansas City to train? No. She's like, so how? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know, honey. Like, this is just the way I cook. And she's like, this is some of the best barbecue. She's like, and they've been back. I mean, unfortunately, we haven't seen them um, in the last few months due to uh, COVID-19 and all that stuff. Uh, but they were, I mean, every time we were at this brewery, they were first in line mm. to get it. That's awesome. And it was like, dude, this is awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's funny, like, People out there listening, you know, you've got a local business, whether it's a restaurant or a landscape company or, or something, just any small business out there. Like you have no idea when you talk to the person that owns it or maybe a manager that's there 60 plus hours a week, you know, giving their heart and soul to that thing, how much mm -hmm. it means to them to hear, thank you, this is awesome. Like, because a lot of times all we hear is griping and complaining and that's fine. Like we want to fix things that we mess up for sure, but when you have a good meal, we tend to just get out, get up and leave. And I yeah. loved when people would come up to us and be like, I really enjoyed this specific part of the meal or this thing you guys did and, and gave us some really great positive feedback. Cause I promise we got enough constructive negative feedback to, for, you know what, for life. Yeah. For days. <laughs> uh, you know what I always say um, is when I get uh, a good, a good review or somebody that says, Oh my God, I loved your food. It was amazing. I'm like, well, 2 a.m. wasn't that bad. And they're like, wait, what? I'm like, 2 a.m. is not that bad anymore. And they're like, you've been up since 2 a.m.? I'm like, yeah. They're like, it's like 8.45. Like, why are you still working? And I'm like, you wanted to eat, right? <laughs> like, Not only did you want to eat, you want to eat like the best barbecue that I think I can make. And that's – Yeah, I and that starts at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. So – I get it, man. Uh I, what I love is the passion. I, I, I know how much of a craftsman you are and how much you care about every little detail being right. Uh, and you and I had that conversation a little bit um, back when I was running a barbecue business and I was I was giving yeah. my two cents on how you should get started. And we ended up talking about employees for a while. And my argument was that eventually you're going to have to go to some sort of automatic smoker. And you were very adamant that you were not. And uh, I, I think it's interesting. Still, uh, we both disagree on that. But we did have the conversation around you had to start to scale at any point to get bigger, to give yourself a day off so you can see that that beautiful family you've got. You got to hire yep. people. So tell me about the first time you hired somebody, fired somebody. Uh, you know, what's it like to train people? And and you're an artist like you're the mastermind behind all the recipes and the cooking. You're giving your art away to another human being to try to represent like walk us through that. Um, so. Hiring, I've always, I've always hired on the, um, the airport bar technique. That's what I like to call it. Wait, I'm sorry. What is the airport bar? It's the airport technique? bar technique. Listen, 
if I am, if I start talking to you in an interview and I can see myself being stuck at an airport bar with you for two hours and talking to you and not wanting to kill you, I'll give you a chance. Because that means I actually like you as a person, right? I find you interesting. I feel like you can add value to my life. If I don't feel like you can add value to me, then I don't need you, right? Mm, mm -hmm. Because if you can't add value to me, guess what? You're not going to add value to anybody else. Mm. And being in the restaurant industry, I believe we add value to people's lives because we cook them a meal, so we're adding value. Mm. It, it, it's not on the menu, but it comes with every meal. Yep. And you know what's an interesting add-on to that is – I can always teach you how to do what I do. It's not, I, you know, it's a, it's a skill set. You've got to learn how to do it. Obviously it's going to take a little bit of time, but I, I will train you how to do everything cradle to grave that I do. Uh, I can't teach you how to be a hard worker. Nope. I can't teach you how to be honest. I can't teach you to be a team player. I can't teach you not to gossip. I can't teach you not to still, I can't teach you to show up on time. I can't teach you values. That yeah. was your mommy and daddy's job. And yeah. as a business owner, unfortunately, I don't have the time to teach you value. Nor do I, I really I, want to. No, and you shouldn't. Like you're, you know, I, I think that was something I should have done much more aggressively when I was a restaurant owner was that as soon as I identified an employee, they got through the interview process and worked for us for a little while. Um, we had a lot of great people that worked for us. But there was a few that got through and, and were employed for a little too long that had had bad values. And I didn't act on it fast enough. And I wish I would have. It took me six years to basically figure out that you cannot change a person's values okay. for them. They're going to have to change it on their own. And the chances they do it while they're working for you, or you give them some sort of magical speech that, that motivates yeah, okay. them to be better human. It's just not going to happen. Like let them go figure it out on their own. And if they come back, I'm all about a second chance, but you're not going to fix them while they're there. So once you identify the problem, you got to cut it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always look at our staff as the island of misfit toys. Uh, you know what I mean? I think that's most kitchen staff. Uh, we're an island of misfit toys. <laughs> oh we don't God. belong anywhere else, so we belong in a kitchen. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I, 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 um, I actually allow my wife to do front of house hiring mm -hmm. because I feel like that's safer <laughs> for everything. Uh, but when, when it comes down to kitchen stuff and all that, um, right now it's actually just me. We're down to a, a, a we're down to a very bare bones staff, obviously with sure. what's going on. Um, we're not able to do the amount of pop-ups we were doing before we're, we're not cooking. No, no one's having catering parties. No one's, you know, no one's having, uh, graduation parties right now. And it's, it, it's dearly affecting our business of where we're at. We're losing quite a bit of money on um, jobs that we thought we were going to have. You know what I mean? Um, Food is a social event anyways. And on top yep. of that, when you're a smaller operation like a food truck or a pop-up, your entire revenue, like 80% of your revenue doesn't come from one-off little $100 jobs. It's the multiple hundred people 50 people, 20 people. It's the massive jobs that really pay the bills. And right yep. now those are gone. They're very, they're very difficult to come by. Yeah. Um, they're downright and, illegal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. They're, they're, you can't do them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, we've still had, um, we work with a couple different businesses that are, that are larger scale businesses that are still working. Mm -hmm. um, and they've, they've had, they've had us come in and cater. You know, but it's still like a weird cater because it's yeah. like, okay, we're going to leave this here and then everyone's going to kind of make their rounds. You know what I mean? Like it's like before it was like, you know, you'd, you'd come and you'd cater and you'd be dropping stuff off and people like people started gathering around and it's like, no, 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 there, there's no gathering. Like we're going to put it here. You're going to leave the room and then like we're going to make a line and then people are going to like circle through the room and then no one's going to see each other. <laughs> They're all going to go back to their own little offices and eat. But, you know. It, 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 you got to do what you got to do in these times. And then we're also doing, uh, we're doing pre-order barbecue um, because obviously we can't just pop up somewhere and hope for the best. Um, we've had a lot of our, our good brewery friends reach out and they're like, dude, come out, come, 
you know, come try to sell meals. And I'm like, yeah, but man, it's barbecue. It's not, it's not a pizza truck. You know, mm-hmm. everybody can say, oh, you want pizza tonight? Great. I'll just grab pizza. Mm-hmm. You got to really agree that you want barbecue or you got to smell it. You got to see it. You got to feel it. Um, and it's just, not, we can't do that right now. Yeah. And the thing that I'm even looking at is, you know, we are sitting down to rethink our entire business model mm. because we don't know at this time when we're going to be able to reopen and recreate, redo what we used to do. If that's even going to ever be possible now, right? Because mm-hmm. in the, we're in the state of Illinois, which is apparently one of the hardest lockdown states. Uh, that's what they're saying with rules. Um, and we're right outside of Chicago and they're breaking it down into four different zones and Chicago being we're in the zone that Chicago's in. And that's going to be, it's going to be the last one to open. Let's be honest. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but they want to open restaurants and breweries and all these things at 50% capacity with, I mean, when they were running at a hundred percent capacity, my goal was to feed 50% of the people. Mm-hmm. Right. And that would sell us out. But now if it's running 50%, I can't run, I can't run my business efficiently at 25% capacity. It's just not yeah. possible. It's not, it's not, it's not worth turning the smoker on. What I love about it though, is that you're an entrepreneur is entrepreneur. You're not folding up. You're not quitting. You're not sucking your thumb on the front porch and boohooing and it's not fair and life's not life's not fair and this isn't easy and it should be easier. And you're just like, you know what? We're going to reevaluate our business model. And to be honest, man, I'm, I, I don't know what you're going to bring out of it, but I'm excited to watch because I know you're a creative guy and you're going to figure out a way to find, like you're going to figure out a way to chase your dream. Like there's nothing that's going to stop you. And that's what really inspires me. And I hope people are getting that out of this interview. Yeah. I mean, with just, just giving a little bit of what we've thought about doing is, is we're going to try to bring, um, which is going to sound kind of weird. We're going to try to bring Texas barbecue to the Chicago land area where, you know, if you go down to like Austin or you go down to, um, I mean, pretty much at Dallas, you know, any, any of the big places, a lot of barbecue places start in what they start in trailers, right? Um, mm-hmm. And they're just a trailer and people walk up, get it and they take it to go. And that's kind of what we're going to, that, that, that's going to have to be our business model for a little bit. So mm-hmm. the only thing that's killing us is like I said, this trailer not getting made right now because mm-hmm. Indiana got shut down completely where manufacturing plants had to be, get, had to be completely shut down. So they're not manufacturing it. So like about three weeks before, this whole thing happened we put a deposit down on a trailer (laughs) just hope they're there when it's when all this gets lifted all we're hoping for man right so um i feel that you know you know you uh, we put out a big chunk of change on that then all this stuff happened um we're still doing i mean we're we're doing the best we can being 60 percent down you know you know what's interesting is that i i hear like the theme here is flexibility Yes. And and that was something when I got into the business, when I got into owning my own business, which is not this is not a restaurant specific trade. I underestimated how flexible I was going to need to be. Um, I felt like we were really lucky that I had four years of Air Force experience behind me. My dad had 20 plus years. My mom was a, you know, a military wife. We had perseverance built into us and flexibility and like things can change in a minute and you can get orders and move and blah, blah, blah. You have to be so ready to change as a business owner if you want to stay afloat. It is shocking to me how many people run their businesses straight into the ground because they never adopt a a sense of urgency about change and doing something different. I mean, it's truly shocking to me. Uh, I think in his book, Good to Great, it was Jim Collins that wrote, the best companies spend about 10 or 15% of their budget on research and development. And all research and development is, is they're constantly trying to iterate and do something new so that they essentially they're trying to put themselves out of business before somebody else does. Exactly. And that's the best companies that adopt that mindset. And I think if you own a business out there and you're not devoting 10% of your time, energy, resources 
to putting yourself out of business, you are leaving yourself so vulnerable to somebody else coming along and doing it for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I believe it was Gary V who kind of like said this, it, and I, I might have changed the quote a little bit, but it's, you know, pivot on a dime, not a dollar. You mm. know what I mean? Like, yeah. because it's much cheaper. It's mu- it's mu- a, it's much cheaper. B, um, if you can't pivot, you know, you're going if you if you're just driving straight, you're gonna hit that brick wall really fast. Um, but if you can start missing some of those bricks, you know what I mean? Just like moving them, uh, it 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 becomes a lot less painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you you catch the side of the wall and not full on uh, frontal like slamming yep. into it. You know. Yep. What is what is the one thing you do for your business every single day that you think is m- the major reason you're successful? That's a great question. Um, we're going. To, getting, we're, 50, we're fifty minutes in. I, I'm bringing the. Yeah, I'm bringing the haymaker. Like we're, we're bringing it to the end. I, I'm coming. I like with it. The, I like it. Um, the over the tops. <laughs> the the one thing that I I, I try to do is sit down and make make a couple of decisions a day. And I don't mean go – I don't mean like make all the decisions for the week. Like Monday I got 25 decisions. Make them all. No. Mm. Like get up, clear head, make three decisions. Um, don't, don't overthink anything. Um, is this the right move for us? Yes or no? Well, mm. let me think about it. No, no, no. Right move for us? Yes or no? What does your gut tell you? Because – the minute you start overthinking everything, you'll change every issue. Mm. And you'll make issues that should be this big into issues that are like gigantic. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That didn't ever have to be an issue. You know, you we'll, spend, we'll spend a hundred hours deciding if we should buy a $200 television for the wall, but we'll spend five minutes making a $50,000 decision. Like yeah. I have no idea why we're so dumb in that way. Like we should spend infinitely more time on the bigger money decision and we should be way more agile in the day-to-day small decisions. Just, yeah, I, I I think it's two things. One paralysis by analysis gets you nowhere. You just end up stuck and in a rut. Uh, And on the other side, if you're not moving, you're like you're either dying or growing and making decisions good or bad is going to at least propel you forward. And if you've yeah. if you made a bad decision, if you made the wrong decision, you can pivot on it like that. When we had our restaurant, we changed the menu 20 times in six years. And every menu, I, I had the intention of that being our final menu and that being the right one. But I was yeah. never afraid to be like, eh, we didn't like it. We, we did the next thing. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, the, there was stuff where I'd, I'd look at and be like, you know, we took chicken off the menu because people weren't buying chicken. Mm-hmm. They were just like, they're like, yeah, your chicken's amazing. Like, like anyone that had our chicken was like, this is the best thing ever. You have to keep it on the menu. And I'm like, yeah, but four people buy it. Yeah. Sorry, it's coming off the menu. And it was always That's actually, hard. I kind of want to sit here for a second. How do you, how do you handle that? Because you're going to have people, you're going to have It's really hard to say no to four people. It's way harder than you think it is because in your mind, like you're a service oriented guy, you're like, I want to serve everybody. I can't take this off the menu. For us, we took salads off the menu. We were selling like 1.3 salads a day and we had to take them off the menu because it, our customers were speaking to us. Yeah. And that was like 40 people a month. That ended up not coming back. A lot of them, few left bad reviews. A few came in and said, oh, I can't come back anymore. I don't have a salad. And it killed me on the inside. But it was the right decision for the business. How do you how do you handle that? Um, so if I get somebody that comes up and they're like, man, I really wanted the chicken. Uh, I'm like, well, did you get anything else? Did mm. you try anything else from us? And I'm like, because if you really love that chicken, I'm like, I promise you the pulled pork is going to be fantastic. Oh, well, I don't like pork. Okay, cool. Well, why don't you try our brisket? Yeah, but you know the brisket's more expensive. This one's on us. Here you go. Yeah. And it, I mean, I've had a lot of success mm. with that by mm-hmm. giving, by giving that service and saying, mm. "Dude, well, well, give it a try. Give it a try here." And they yeah. they've been like, "Yeah, but I don't want to. You know, I don't want to pay that. I don't want to pay that price." 
because our chicken mm-hmm. was substantially less, right? It was about it was about three dollars less than our brisket. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, I'll give you, you know, I was kind of, I did the drug dealer mentality, you know, the first hit's free. Here you go. Here, give it a try. And man, it hooked a lot of people on our brisket, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, or you know, I would, you know, I would throw, I, I'd throw them a free side. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, if you go, I'm like, if you go with the. Uh, with the brisket, you know, we'll give you free mac and cheese. Mm, I like and that. And they were like, oh, cool. Well, I'll get a yeah, free mac and cheese then. And, and, and then it's kind of – then I, I used to get the chicken and the mac and cheese, and it was, you know, X amount of dollars. But now they're giving me the brisket, and they're giving me a free mac and cheese for this time. That's fantastic. I'll do that. Yeah. Anytime you give to somebody first, like, they're always going to try to reciprocate it down the road. I mean, especially – I mean, they're going to like the food. So it's going to work out for you in the long run. Yeah. Uh, Mikey, we're almost out of time here, man. I, I want to ask you one last question here. When you, when you, if you were to sit down and talk to an aspiring entrepreneur, you know, somebody that was getting ready to make that decision to go into some sort of business, you know, okay. what is the biggest piece of advice you wish you had before you started? Um, I mean, I, I wish I still had somebody to talk to like that. Um, Hey man, you got my phone number. You call me. I, I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> You got a, you got a kid though. I don't want to bother you at home. Uh, one of the, one of the biggest things is like really know your business, really get to know it. And it, you know, there, you're not going to get to know the whole thing because you're not working in it. But if you want to be, um, if you want to be a tech guy, no, no, know the tech industry. If mm-hmm. you want to be, um, a marketing person, make sure you know your marketing, marketing stuff. I don't know how many marketing people I've talked to to try to hire them. And I'm just like, okay, cool. So like, and the, like, what can you do for me? You know what I mean? Like sell me on your, on your service. And they're like, well, what do you want us to do? And how much do you want to pay us? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that's not how this works. How are you going to grow my business? And yeah. So like I how are you going to make me yeah. money? No, I, I don't want to grow your marketing business. I want yeah, you to grow yeah. my business. Hey, if you ever get to the point where you just want to hand people money for no reason, you you let me know. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, so it, it's getting to know the business side of it and and learn business and then learn to love to lose. Mm. You gotta learn to love to lose and continue going. Because yeah. one of the things that I always I say it in all my in all my barbecue classes that I teach and all this stuff, I go, you wanna know the difference between me and you? And they're all like, yeah, we want to know. There's like, I'm like, there's a huge secret, big secret. I'm going to help you out right now. There's only, there's one big difference between you and me. And they go, what? And I, and, and in the barbecue class, I say, I've cooked more shitty food than you ever have. <laughs> right? Because it's, I've, I've done, I've made more mistakes than you've tried. So mm-hmm. I always say that. I go, the difference between me and you is I failed more times than you've tried. And that's the only difference. So if you want to start a business, make sure you're willing to fail more times than somebody else has tried to do that business. Because that's what's going to lead you to success. The, the failures are going to lead you to bigger successes than all your wins. Because when you win, you're on a high for like two minutes and you don't learn anything from it. When you lose, mm-hmm. you sit back, you regroup, and you go forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a cycle of failure. You have this, you're going up with success, and then you'll fail, and then you have this period of reflection, and in you gain momentum in that period of reflection that like launches you mm-hmm. up into the right again. Yep. Uh, man, if you got time for one more bonus question here, you mentioned, you, uh, you mentioned family, and- Something else I underestimated when I was getting into the business world was how much of a strain it was going to be on my family. So how do you maintain balance between the entrepreneur life and family, friends, intellectual goals, physical goals, all that kind of stuff? Because very quickly, while you think about it, very quickly, when you become an entrepreneur, the career piece of your goal pie becomes 80, 85, 90, 100% if you're not careful. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm an obsessed human. So when I find something that I want to do, I, I obsess over it. And I think that's what actually helps me, um, 
get to where I need to go, right? I obsess over it. I make sure that no matter what, I'm like failure is not an option. Like it's just not. Um, and I think that might be one of my downfalls. I don't, I don't, I don't have a plan B, right? There's no plan B. Uh, just keep going. But um, one of the things that I, you know, it, it's working on yourself, making sure you reflect, give yourself time. If you don't give yourself time, um, everyone else around you is going to hate you, right? Because you're not working on yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for family, it's make sure that you give them time because that's the only thing you can't buy and I can't sell. I can't buy your time and I can't, I can sell, I can sell my time, Mm. but I can't buy your time. Right. Yep. So I, I make sure that we have time with the family. Um, we, you know, me and the wife said that like, which is this is gonna every entrepreneur is gonna like freak out right now. We go on a vacation a year, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? I don't yeah. It. What is a vacation when you're an entrepreneur? I don't. I don't believe exactly. It. <laughs> but that gives us that gives us family time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They, it's one week a yeah. year. And here's if the your thing business too about can't that. survive, dude. You shouldn't be in business. It's not a business. And the thing about that is too. It, balance doesn't necessarily mean every single day I spend eight hours in the office. I spend mm-hmm. four hours with my family and I spend one hour at the gym and 30 minutes reading and 10 minutes journaling. And like, it's mm-hmm. not every single day is not the same plan. Stuff's going to happen. Your smoker's going to break and you're going to have to repair it and it ruins the whole day. Yeah. Like stuff happens. But on a macro, when you, when you step back and you, you look at a year in review you know, if you only focus on your family for an entire week, you can spend a lot of quality time in seven straight days. And if Absolutely. you take off one weekend a month or a Monday, Tuesday, because in the restaurant business, we have a little bit weird weekend situation mm-hmm. where yeah. our weekends are Monday and Tuesdays. Pretty like, much, yeah. And you don't turn on the dog on television and you focus actually on your family and you do the things with them. Like you can create balance, but you have to be disciplined about it because if you're not, it's very like we talked about it a little bit earlier. Being an entrepreneur is very much, it's a very addicting process. And yeah. the high of people coming up to you and loving you, the high of of failing and then surviving the failure, like if you're not careful, entrepreneurship will become a insane drug that will, like just like any other drug, alcohol, it's whatever. just like heroin. It'll, it'll, it'll literally ruin your life if you're not careful. I mean, we see it all the time in the news, like people that like hustle culture or whatever, they, yeah. they, they fly too high for too long. And then all of a sudden that little puppy becomes a monster in their house. Yeah. I, I'm not a, I'm not a firm believer in the no days off, you know, like mm. no days off, bro. Gotta go every day. gotta go every day. Like, mm, you know, yeah, that's just ignorant there. You know, there, there's a thing, you know, even the best engines break. Yep. Right. No matter what. So to me, it's make sure you focus on that. And man, I got a, I I got a little girl. So, um, you know, being able to go with, with our industry, you know, being a little weird, uh, you know, she has dance class or she had dance classes on, on Wednesday mornings. Dude, I was the only dad there. Mm. I was the only dad. All the moms were there. I was the only dad. So they were all like looking at me all like weird. You know what I mean? Because, mm-hmm. you know, my wife's there. I'm there. She's there like, clearly he doesn't have a job. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's like, but it's like, man, no, I own my own business. So that allows me a little bit of flexibility and gives me a little bit of time. So I can actually watch my daughter dance. Well, well, you know, the other dads have yeah. to go hustle. Yeah. But you that means that. intentional about that time. But that means, that means that I lose. But I, you know, when they're home on Saturday night drinking with the boys, and you know, moving the moving the kids away from them because they want to keep drinking, dude. I'm at work. I'm hustling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when my time's off, I put it into that. Like let let's put let's put quality time into there. Let let's see. You know, my one of my favorite things is cooking with my kid. Mm-hmm. So we we take time to cook together. We make you know we make pastas. We make eggs. We make um, we make pancakes. We make German pancakes. We do all the stuff that she loves it. And and being able to cook together is so much fun. And as she's getting older, because she, she's turning three, so now it's starting to become – she's starting to get more interactive and she's starting to like it even more. But 
man, it's just, it's awesome. I can't wait for her to launch her own YouTube show. That I'm going to watch every episode because oh she is a <laughs> ham sandwich, bro. She is, yeah, she is so sweet, sure. and she owns the room. I don't, yeah, I don't know fantastic. if she gets that from mom or dad. I don't know, but uh, definitely not mom. <laughs> definitely not mom. Yeah, you bet. You better be glad you're uh, you're hiding the uh, the office. In the office. There. <laughs> yeah, in the silence. Uh, you know, I and and for anybody out there, like uh, you've you've posted a few photos on uh, on I think it was Mammy Barbecue. I saw you guys cooking together. Yeah, um, yeah. On Instagram there. So you know, we know we can find you at Mammy Barbecue. Where else can we find you on the internet, Mikey? And uh, so you can find me at Man Me Barbecue uh, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and all that stuff. Um, my name is Mikey K. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is Mikey K. Um, and then Fire and Smoke Barbecue.com. So it's Fire and Smoke BBQ.com is our website. You can buy our full range of seasonings there. You can also book us for any catering orders or anything like that. Um, and then it's Fire and Smoke Barbecue on Facebook. It's Fire and Smoke Barbecue Company on Facebook. And then, unfortunately, we couldn't get that on Instagram because there's too many people with that. So we're Fire, we're Fire Smoke underscore BBQ on Instagram. Um, so that's where you can find those those things. Really, what we we're trying to develop is the website because um, I'm trying to build a real business. I don't want it to go away when Instagram dies or when TikTok <laughs> dies. You know what I mean? Like it's all about you, real, real business, real ground stuff. I feel it. We're, we'll, we'll make sure to link it up. Uh, Perfect. In the comments for sure. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching today. Thank you for listening to today's show. I hope you got a ton of value out of today's interview. You know, I've known Mikey for a couple years now and the man Honestly, the guy works just really hard and he's got passion and we mentioned it in the episode. We argue about the dumbest stuff and I swear the only arguments we ever have are always centered around passion. And you know what? I think Mikey might have a little bit more passion, especially for barbecue than me. And like, uh, I don't want him to hear that. So, uh, well, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next week.